Well, hello, everybody. My name is Albert. I'm an ex-con with a new mission and goal in life to help others avoid the troubles that I endured by going to the penitentiary and serving approximately half of my current lifetime in the penitentiary. I'm 46 years old, and I've served many of calendar years in the penitentiary. I come from a dark past to where I've I've stayed within the dark the majority of my lifetime and I'm just breaking out into the light have a good following on a couple of Facebook groups building a new YouTube so I hope that you subscribe and follow me as I'm here to not only give details of what it's like to have to endure the penitentiary in the justice system but even more importantly in the way that I feel as though I can help people is how to overcome the personal darkness that comes through uh, being adopted, being in foster care, trying to adjust to a new family atmosphere while growing in a small town and enduring uh, a lot of different things in life that I'm sure many of us have endured. But it affected me a little bit differently because I was very dark and hidden within my own self. So I wanted to create an intro today to introduce myself, get you guys a little acclimated with who I am, what I'm about. And I know maybe I come across a little bit differently than a lot of the YouTube people that you watch. Hopefully I break loose a little bit personality wise, but this is very new to me. So forgive me as I get moving forward. Again, my name is Albert. I'm 46 years old. I was born in a little town in Colorado called Canyon City. We always joked around in my growing up and in, even in my later years, the biggest thing in Canyon City that was on the main drag was the penitentiary. That just happened to be where I was born to a young lady. Wasn't prepared whatsoever to have children. She was still living the party life. Did a lot of drugs, partied it up with a lot of men, hence why we still to this day don't even know who my biological father is. I was taken away relatively right after birth for malnutrition. Type 1 diabetic, severely underweight, wasn't fed properly, so the state stepped in and took me away and needless to say I ended up in foster care spent the next seven years almost eight years in foster care moving around quite a bit throughout not only the state of colorado but also new mexico a few other states i was one of the long-term residents of that foster care never really had much to my name for many years and from all the pictures that i've seen that were provided didn't even have clothes I'm sure they fed me. I'm sure everything was okay. Don't don't remember much about it. And don't have a lot of stories. Met one of my best friends in life while we were in foster care. That kind of led me into some of my behaviors later in life. And also it helped me end up in the penitentiary for a biggest portion of my sentence. We'll discuss her more at another time. But So, my mom was a heavy drug addict, which caused me major health issues when I was born. Not only was I malnutritioned, but a lot of weight issues. I was born severely underweight and kept within the hospital to try to get me to normal weight for months upon months upon months. And after being taken away, I made many more visits to the emergency room, even prior to the age of one. Foster care is what it is. We all that have endured it build trust issues and many other things. I guess I had an attachment disorder that I never recognized or paid attention to even into my older years. I'm not even sure my adoptive parents actually knew what that was, but it was a good family that adopted me, my mother and father. My father being an ex-Navy man, he had given up an actual pro baseball career with the New York Yankees in the farm system to go into the military so they could support my young mother. They were both young. 
when he got out of the military, they moved back to Colorado from New York and decided that they wanted to build a family. So they had my older sister and then they adopted me years later. I was adopted at the age of eight and brought into a family that had a 16 year old daughter and then myself an eight year old son. Within six months, they, uh, they divorced. My father had cheated on my mother and decided that he wanted to run off and marry his much younger secretary. So my adoptive father and my adoptive sister both immediately left out of my life within six months of my adoption. So it was back down to my mother and I. I don't know because I don't remember a lot of it, but I guess it created even more trust issues because again, more people were walking out of my life and didn't really want me in my mind, in my emotions, in my senses. So I developed even more trust issues, but I created a very good bond with my adopted mother who later moved away and moved to New Mexico. A couple years later, met an awesome man, my stepfather, greatest man I ever met in my life a real man, took care of my mother, took me in as a son without any question whatsoever. A couple years later, they had a son of their own, so now I had a younger brother. Still had no older sister, never even talked to my adoptive father. He was now out of the picture, so it was our little family living in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Father, mother, younger brother and I. It seemed like it'd be the perfect little setting, perfect little family. Banker for a father, great man, well respected, very honest, hardworking. Grew up in a little town called Artesia, New Mexico, and they were feed and seed workers as my grandfather owned the feed and seed store and ran it for well over 50 years. Still within their family to this day. My mother, Age of 38, finally decided to go back to college. She was a nurse when she was younger, but obviously because my adoptive father was kind of strict, she got to stay home and watch the kids while he worked. He was one of those ones that didn't want his wife to hold a, a job or a career. So she put everything on hold to take care of the family. Now with her new husband, she had the opportunity to go for her goals in life. So she went back to school. She got her master's degree in education, became a school teacher, did it for over 25 years, was amazing at it. Got what was taught, what was called uh, country living, kindergarten, first and second grade, all in one classroom. She got to keep the kids for three years. Amazing setup for her. She just adored children. And she was just a great motherly figure and a great teacher. The hard part of it all was I just was in a dark spot and not really a big part of the family. It wasn't their fault. They did what they could for the most part. Their son was top priority and him and I never really had a great bond due to the fact he didn't feel as though because I was not blood, I wasn't a part of the family stated it to me many times, which drove even more wedges within me emotionally. So obviously, I became your constant, on-the-go runaway, trying to finish school, trying to be normal in life. I didn't want anybody to know what it was like on the inside of me. I didn't want anybody to know me. So I put on a good show. I became a really good liar. Sadly, while, be, while doing all that, I became a good thief, good scam artist, even at the young age. Got arrested for the first time at 11. <laughs> Those baseball cards and theft of uh, alcohol from your local Albertsons is a great way to get your first conviction. They got to had good parents that came down to a jailhouse, embarrassed as you could be, to get me out of jail and try to teach me the right lessons. They tried to get me counseling because they knew there was a problem. 
There was an attachment problem. I, I just, I couldn't see eye to eye. I was a hard worker. I was an intelligent kid. I played every sport. I was a great athlete. I worked. I had no problem working. The problem was, is everything was consumed inside of me. The pain. The hurt. And I wouldn't let it out. I wouldn't talk to anybody about it. I wouldn't let anybody into my life to help me. Nobody understood. Nobody knew what it was like. I hoarded food underneath my bed till I was the age of 15 years old. I'm sure you can imagine. You're sitting down with your family to eat a great dinner. One of your children wanders off with his plate of food and you just kind of wonder, what, what is he doing? Later that night, you go to check on him while he's in bed, and <laughs> lo and behold, right underneath his bed is that plate of food, just stored away for later. The problem is, he also found his last three lunch sacks and other hidden little treats that he had taken out of the cupboards and hidden underneath his bed, just in case there was nothing left for later. My parents couldn't even let me eat an apple or a pear. I'd eat the whole core. Most of the time, choke on it. They had to cut my food up for me to ensure that I didn't gnaw on the bones all the way down because I was so afraid I wasn't getting the next meal and nobody understood the whole reasoning behind that. I was malnutrition. I, I just, to this day, I mean, it's even hard for me now, my wife, is finally one of the first ones, and she's the one that's actually pushed me out to, to start relating and coming out into the light. My wife is the one that truly has fought hard to understand me and learn what is the reasoning behind a lot of my thinking and my emotions. She's also the one that's pushed me to become more driven in helping others to not only understand what they're enduring and that it's okay that they're enduring it, and it's okay to accept somebody to stand next to them and help them through. I needed that support when I was young and there was nobody there to give it to me. I went to counseling. All they wanted to do was prescribe me some pills and I never accepted that. I knew right from wrong. I also knew what the pain was inside of me and that's why I acted out the way I did. My wife told me because I was discussing this with her before I came on and like I said, this is my first time. And I said, honey, what, what am I going to do? What am I, this is an intro, I need people to feel like, I need them to understand me because this is how I can get them to want to come back and hear what I have to say again and again and again. And they're going to be the ones that could possibly look to me to help their kids that are enduring many of the things I did. And she looked at me and says, uh, you just tell them a story about your younger years that one can make them feel, but also make them laugh and maybe even cry. I said, well, honey, what happens if that makes me cry? She says, it's okay, you're allowed to do that. That's what being real and true is about. That's the one thing in my life that I always shied away from. I never let anybody know the real, true, raw me. The inner part of me. So I thought real hard and I wanted to come up with that story that would just touch everybody and kind of give them an idea of kind of what my thought process back in my younger years were. So I... I kind of thought of one I thought was a little bit funny, but it's pretty serious as well because there's many kids out here that probably do this, and it it shows a lot of things at a young age that there's going to be some later problems. And I think this actually was a leading uh, sign that I would end up in the penitentiary one day. I was uh, nine years old. My mom had married my stepfather and it was just us at the time my younger brother hadn't been born yet but 
I hadn't accepted the new life yet. I hadn't accepted the the easiness, I guess, of being within a home with a mom and a dad. I was still kind of accustomed to that foster home with not being the only child that they had to raise or take care of and not getting the clothes when they were needed, not getting to eat every single meal when it was time for dinner or breakfast or lunch. Now I'm in a home that they care about me, but my mom's going to school full time. She's working a full time job. Uh, my stepfather, the hardest worker I ever met in my life. I mean, he worked so much overtime, not only at the bank, but then he helped uh, my uncle, his his twin brother, do mortgages and rental properties on top of that. So it was a busy home busy household and I was busy going to school but when I wasn't busy going to school I was at home and uh, I was taking care of myself I was considered capable of taking care of myself so I became a loner I became very internalized and uh, anytime my parents expected something of me that I, I didn't agree with I I decided to run away so one time a argument broke out between my stepfather and I and I went into my little room and I packed a couple of sets of my little outfits and my little pair of boots into a Snoopy suitcase that they had gotten me. One of my pride and joys, my Snoopy suitcase. Well I packed that thing as tight as I could with the the clothes that I was going to take with me and off I ventured out that front door and down the sidewalk of our cul-de-sac heading down the road to the main getaway and the only thought process I had in my mind was food McDonald's need to get to McDonald's I had a pocket full of quarters I had taken them off the top of the bed where Joe and my mom my stepfather and my mom slept every night and I took myself a good handful of those quarters that he put up there and I headed off for that McDonald's with my Snoopy bag and my clothes and I was going to disappear for a lifetime just trudging my way down never realized that my stepfather was just 15-20 steps behind me just let me walk on my way Peaceful as could be, nobody around. He never interrupted me one time in my little prance and walk. He just wanted to make sure I was safe. Made it to McDonald's, got up to the counter, and it was time. I was getting my ice cream cone. No Snoopy bag and all, and police officer was standing behind me in the line at the McDonald's, and tapped me on the shoulder and I turned around and I said yes officer as I had just began to learn how to talk yeah that's right I, I didn't talk till I was old, seven years old I mean I spoke but not clearly and not with the correct wording like most children I was intelligent I just didn't speak correctly well I was proud now because my stepfather and my mom had worked with me and got me to where I could say things appropriately. So when I turned around, I spoke to that officer and I said, uh, well, hello, officer. And he looked at me and says, son, are you, are you here on your own? I looked back at him and a stern look in my face and said, why did you call me son? I'm not your son. First sign big trouble. Already a disrespectful come back to law enforcement. Nine years old. Waiting on an ice cream cone. My stepfather saw the whole thing happen. So embarrassed. Shook his head. Walked up and let the officer know that my father was right behind me. He sat down and he explained to the officer what had transpired, that I had this habit of running away. And today I had just packed a 
full bag and I was determined I was going to be away for good. I was never coming home again. The officer just shook his head and completely understood because my stepfather was a well-respected man in our little town. People loved him for his honesty and his hard work and the way that he just cared about everybody. And that officer knew that this little man with the Snoopy suitcase was in good hands and he was going to be all right. Stepdad and I sat down, ate that ice cream cone, and we even got a couple of Big Macs. Didn't say a word to each other until the end when he asked me if I was ready to go home. For the first time, I looked at him and said, I don't know if I have a home. I don't feel like I have a home. And I think I broke his heart. I know if my mom had heard me say that, it would have broke her heart. But he convinced me to walk on home with him and unpack that Snoopy bag told me give it one week if it wasn't any better he would let me go he would fill up that Snoopy bag for me and he would drop me back off at that same McDonald's with that same pocket full of quarters and he would wish me farewell and hope that I found better down the road did say I, I never did pack that Snoopy bag again but I never did feel at home either. It was never their fault. I just had trust and emotional chaos going on that I couldn't figure out. At the age of 11 when I decided that I was going to become a criminal I walked down and loaded a duffel bag full of baseball cards and alcohol. Getting caught. Trying to outrun the police at the age of 11. Being handcuffed. Being taken in the back of the police car to the jail. Being put into a cell. Having them have to call my parents to come get me. Devastated my parents. Devastated them again. This was becoming a constant thing. I was a loving kid. Huge heart. Loved everybody. I was just very private and a troublemaker. And had a lot of emotional issues. But here I sat in a jail cell that's supposed to be scary and teach people not to do things. I wasn't scared. I had no fear of that jail cell. I had no fear of the ranting and raving kids down the row that were in their 30th, 40th day of being incarcerated and waiting for trial on their charges. I didn't care what they were there for. Some were there for the same thing as me. Simple theft. Some not so much. I was just a couple of cells down from a kid that killed his family. A couple of cells down from that were some gangbangers that had gotten into a shooting and killed a couple of minors. I had no fear of them. I had no fear of the system. parents came down to pick me up and I remember my stepfather's telling the officers maybe I just need to leave them here to teach him a lesson and the officer shook his head and said I don't think this is going to teach him anything I don't think he has any fear of where he's at right now and heck he may just get comfy and want to stay a while didn't matter to me didn't bother me a bit 
It was the first time, but it sure wasn't going to be the last. Fourteen years old was the time that I got locked up, and boy, did I get locked up that time. It just kept getting worse, and worse, and worse, and worse, and I could be like all the others that come on here to do the various different shows, and we could talk about all the prison politics. I know all the prison politics, guys. I've got 38 felony convictions, and I've done time in so many different states. I could tell you the different various politics. I'm a max security close custody card in, uh, inmate. Not protective custody. Yeah, I've done a lot of time in segregation, but it wasn't because I was a protective custody case. It's because I earned my way into segregation through fighting or, or through some sort of disorderly violent contact on a prison yard. I didn't ever even fear prison. I just got released a couple of years, and the only thing I can say I've actually feared was my time getting out of prison and coming home to a wife that loved me and supported me and thought that I was going to be able to change my world and move forward from that point forward and just do great things. I even make, made her get to the point she had to give me an ultimatum, everybody. Change what you're doing now and how you think and act or you don't have me anymore in your life. I will leave. She didn't want to leave me. I was pushing her to the point she had to leave me. Just like the rest of my family that's no longer. Just like all my good friends through the years of life. No longer. Some of my best friends, yes, have passed and that tore a hole within me, but most of them I've ran off myself. This is what people that are convicts that go to prison have within their mindset. Many are intelligent. Most have an emotional chaotic chaos going within them that they can't control. That ultimatum combined with the support and the knowledge that I needed help, I needed counseling. I needed to figure these emotions out to go in a better direct line forward and I set a goal for myself that I wanted to help others so they didn't endure exactly what I did. Prison riots, jail cells, running from the law, lying to family, Stealing from people that care about you. It's ridiculous. Never had a drug addiction in my life, but they said because of my biological mother's drug addiction that I got a lot of the side effects and a lot of the issues that come from that as well. So here I am at the age of 46, and also a lot of people walk by me because of my thin body nature which is type 1 diabetes and also health issues that they don't know about. Many of them look at me and claim that I'm a drug addict. I have no teeth in my mouth because of the diabetes and different uh, health issues. They all shattered and broke through the years and I have full out dentures. Right now I'm, I don't even have them in because I have to rest my my gums at times because if I wear those dentures for a full eight to ten hours a day they, it tears up my gum line and uh, because I've had my jawline broken so many times it's hard for me to talk for more than 15 20 minutes at a time wearing my dentures so you can only imagine when people walk by me and they see it they think I'm a drug addict I've been called a meth addict cocaine addict everything else I've never even done a drug in my life doesn't mean I haven't been around them and hell, prison is all about the drugs, but never put a drug in my body. I don't even take Tylenol. Yet people judge me in ways that will knock anybody down. They'll keep you in the depression. It's hard to, to open up and 
and see the light and, and be bright in everyday life and be happy and be jovial and jump up and down, which there are times where I, I'm one of the biggest smiling circuses you'll ever see. But 85% of the time, I can hardly even just want to, to go outside. It's called depression. It's also called, I don't even fully trust myself at times, so I won't go do something stupid while I'm out there. But I'm on a good path. A year and a half of hard work. No issues, no police contact. Working with the wife to better the marriage and get a better understanding of each other and also building more of a trust factor that I truly believe she's with me for life and she 100% supports me. She believes in me more than I believe in me. That's why I'm here before you. And I hope this video just doesn't turn you off and say, oh God, this guy's crazy. I'm not crazy. Trust me, we're going to have some cool conversations. I'm just introducing me, raw me. This gives you a feel. I can tell you all about the prison stories and all the convicts that I met and some of the big name people that, oh my God, you did prison time with that person? Yes, I did. But there are so many to get on and talk about prison politics and the way prison is and the fist fights and all the stabbings. Yeah, I got holes in me too from stabbings. Is that the greatest thing that we always have to talk about? No, we need to talk about how we're going to improve what our younger age children are doing today in society. How do we catch these things that are happening? How do we make them feel like someone actually understands? We need to stop the kids from going to the schools and feeling like they need to take out 30 to 40 people within their school just by bringing a gun to school and acting foolish because they just are so devastated on the inside over something and nobody paid attention or caught it. I'm a true crime guy too. I love true crime cases. I'm a member of the Idaho 4 discussion groups talking about the Idaho 4 uh, murder cases complete craziness of why did those four individuals have to lose their lives I, I, I guarantee you it's somebody that's got some sort of social issue and emotional chaos like what I've endured my entire life that nobody's reached out to to support and to build trust with them and to, to get them to understand somebody cares it's not done by a normal person it's done by somebody that's in pain that's why I did what I did I didn't do what I did because I thought it was cool I didn't do what I did because I thought it would give me a great career in life I threw away my career in life. A 20 some year veteran in the penitentiary comes out and somebody's going to give him a corporate job as a high paid official. Come on. You're going to work day labor and you're going to make minimum wage and you're going to fight to pay your bills. It's what prison does. Some become successful, and it's great. I applaud them. And I'm on my way as well. The first step I have to do is get myself into a brighter place, and this is teaching me how to do that. I have to be honest. 45 years it took me to figure that out. You've got to be real. You've got to be honest. I can't just act as if I care. I need to show people I care. I need to be a part of the caring process. I own three pit bulls. Amazing dogs. Love them to death and they love me. One of the most 
misunderstood breeds in the world. My wife says, well, it's the perfect one for you because you were once misunderstood and now people are learning. Just like the breed of pit bulls, people are learning. They're lovers. They only fight when you force them. I only fought and did what I did in life because I thought it was my only option. It's probably not the introduction all of you expected. I didn't know how to do an introduction. I Honestly, I don't meet and greet people very well, but I'm working on it. And I hope I get better at it. I hope I keep improving. I'm not giving up. I'm not giving in. I'm not a failure. Have I failed at things? Yes, I've come up short. But I haven't quit. So there's no failure in me. Moving forward, I will not fail. Because I will not give in. I will not quit. And I will not go back ever to that old thinking and lifestyle that I thought was my only way of living I will not do it I love my wife I love my dogs and I feel legitimately in my heart I've taken a little piece from my wife and I actually believe I can make a difference. I can make a difference. And that's why I ask you guys to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Keep checking in with me because we're going to go on a roller coaster ride. We're going to have some amazing conversations. We're going to talk about so many things. We're going to have some fun. We're going to have some laughs. We'll probably shed a few tears. But at the end of the day, we're all going to be better people. I'm going to learn. I hope I can help you learn a few things about where I come from and what I've been through and some of the knowledge that I've garnered and gained. If I could just get one other person that's constantly going back to jail or constantly going to prison to listen to me and stop doing it and join my team and actually doing better for those around us, we can make even a bigger difference. And each person I can get to join that team is an even bigger difference that we can make. The more teens that we could reach out to and stop from doing the stupidity that's happening in today's society, that's something I'll take pride, pride from. That's something I could take with me to my grave and say, I accomplished something. So subscribe to my channel, Convict's Thoughts. I'll always be a convict because that part of me can never completely leave because I have to remember every lesson I learned. And all the thoughts I had through the years while I laid in the darkness of why, 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 why. Well, I'm learning why. And I'm learning how. And I'm gonna continue moving forward. So, appreciate you guys joining me. Please subscribe to the channel, A Convict's Thoughts. This is just the introduction. Part two, we'll talk a little bit of prison life. Have a great one.